All right, let's talk about robotics. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of theory, and then we're going to go into the actual Python code. So here I have a picture of the simplest possible robot arm. The technical term for robot arm is a manipulator. And I'm looking at this textbook here, which is from the University of Illinois, specifically from their Intelligent Motion Laboratory, part of the CS department. And this is an excellent textbook with lots of great explanations, uh, clear math, and most importantly, really good figures. So this one right here is a planar manipulator with two joints, these circles here, and two links. So it's planar because it's just in two dimensions, um, but this can be generalized to three dimensions. So I think it's best to start here. So physically, these joints here are motors, and they go through a particular angle, which we can control. The links here are rigid lines, uh, rigid parts of the arm, and we cannot control them except for the angle. And here we just have two links, two joints, and at the end, the end effector. And that's just a generic term for a robot hand. So we could put a literal hand here. We could also put a robot grip. We could put a screwdriver, whatever tool we want. And the whole point of robotics and specifically motion planning is that we want this end effector to go to a certain goal. And specifically, we want to move this to a specified position and a specified orientation. And the question is, how do we move these motors so that we get this end effector to the position and orientation that we want to go? Let me briefly mention here that this type of joint where it moves through an angle like this is called a revolute joint from the word revolution. But we can also have other types of joints like a prismatic joint, which is a linear joint where one link slides relative to the other. So imagine a telescope or a tripod. Uh, the motion is linear, right? But we can also have things like hinge joints. So that's like a door. Uh, but typically, especially for industrial robots, all the joints are these revolute joints. So uh, it's probably best just to start with these types of joints. So basically, note that the link here, the distance from one joint to the other, doesn't change. I mean, it's a rigid body, right? But the end of one link uh, versus the beginning of it can change because of this uh, motor, right? So there are two problems to solve here. So one is, given I have some values for these motors, where is the end effector? And that's a very easy problem to solve. So that problem is called forward kinematics. So given these joints, we're going to move forward from the base. This first link here is called the base. Uh, and we keep going until we get to the end effector. And there's another class of problems called inverse kinematics, which is much harder. And that's the problem that I mentioned at the beginning, which is where we have some goal for the end effector. And we want to compute backwards what the Q1 and Q2 would be to get to where we want to go. So I'm just going to stick to forward kinematics. And long story short, we can represent where this end effector is going to be by a series of rotations and translations. So a translation is where you move only in position. So this is just adding a vector, right? So we, we start here. This is some vector in two dimensions, 0, 0, right? And we have this other uh, joint here. And we move along x and we move up y. And that uh, change is just another vector, right? We add that to 0, 0, we get the position, the center of this uh, joint there. And then we repeat the same process to get to x. And that gives us just the uh, translation of x. But if we want the full story, if we want the rotation, which is to say the orientation of x, we need to take into account the angle as well. So the rotation of this link and the rotation of this link. So we can use rotation matrices. And if you remember from last time, a rotation matrix is just a special type of orthogonal matrix. So a three by three matrix. In this case, because it's 2D, we can just do a two by two matrix. And from this angle Q1, we can compute the rotation. So this L1, uh, if Q1 is zero, it just lines up with this line here. So the positive uh, X axis, for instance. And uh, by applying Q1, we can compute the, what the rotation matrix would be. And by adding the translation as well, we can get uh, this line here, right? 
So we get the orientation of this line and also the position of this joint. And then taking this to be the new origin, we can also apply another rotation matrix based on uh, this Q2 value. And then that will tell us how this link is oriented relative to this line up here. And then we crawl along a certain distance. This is the translation. Uh, and then we get from here to here, right? So all in all, we've applied uh, a rotation and translation to get from here to here. And then we've applied another rotation and translation from here to here. And we can have an arbitrarily long manipulator with many links, and we just go step by step from one to the other. So you might think this is kind of complex and nonlinear because you know we've got a rotation and a translation. But the thing is, we can actually combine our rotation matrix and our translation vector into one big 4x4 four four matrix. And there's another chapter in this textbook, and also in, in many robotics textbooks, that talks about something called a homogeneous matrix. And homogeneous matrices show up everywhere when you're talking about 3D stuff. So robotics, computer graphics, computer vision, all that sort of stuff. And if you go through the math, basically, you end up with this thing here. This is our homogeneous matrix, uh, and it's labeled T for transform. And the top left uh, of this matrix is a 3x3 three three submatrix, which is just the rotation matrix from before. And the last column here, the first three components, are the translation in the x, y, and z coordinates. And the bottom row, just a bunch of zeros, and at the end here we have a 1. And to get to the derivation of this, um, it's not that complicated, but I'm not going to spend time right now going through it. But just take my word for it that this 4x4 four four matrix is uh, the equivalent of doing a rotation and a translation separately. And the very convenient thing about this is that to get from one link to another, to get from here to here and then here to here, we can just multiply these 4x4 four four matrices together. We don't need to do any complex... Um, a rotation followed by a translation and moving things around, we just multiply these 4x4 four four matrices together and we can get the position and orientation of the end effector relative to the base. So this is really convenient. The one part of this that's nonlinear is that this rotation uh, depends on the angle. So it depends on this Q1 and Q2, right? So for each um, link, for each link joint, we have a different matrix, right? And that matrix is a function of the joint angle. Uh, note that because the link is rigid, uh, this really simplifies things. In its own coordinate frame, the distance between the two points never changes, right? The coordinates never change. We just need to change this Q1. So uh, that said, if we know the joint values, and we know them because you know we're the one controlling the robot, uh, they're motors, right? So we just read the motor value. Uh, we can compute for each link this matrix. And then we can just multiply them together with matrix multiplication, and we end up with one big end product, right? We end up with a 4x4 four four matrix at the end, uh, which tells us how to get from the base of the robot to the end effector. So everything simplifies really nicely because of matrix multiplication. So once again, talking about inverse kinematics, things get a lot more complicated because you have some end uh, transformation you want to reach. Right, some 4x4 four four matrix, that's the end goal. That would be the transform of the end effector in the base coordinates. But these matrices in between, uh, they're all functions of the Q1, Q2, Q3 angles. Right? So you can't just invert the matrices or do some really simple algebra to get there. One of the problems is that, for example, this joint here could actually be down here, for example. If we ignore the ground here, we could actually have the arm go down and then up, and then we could get to the same x, right? And uh, maybe we can just twist this end effector a little bit and we can get to the orientation we want also. So this corresponds to, for example, the human arm. If you want to grab a cup, right, your hand has to be at a certain position, but it's also got to be at a certain orientation so that you can grab the size of the glass. But your elbow can be up or down or actually any, any number of different uh, positions and orientations as long as your hand is in the right position and orientation. So you have basically an infinite number of solutions uh, in which you can place your hand. So typically, you place your hand in the most, most uh, natural way. Uh, you know, you don't want to lift your elbow up really high because that just doesn't make sense. 
Um, but to be more specific about that, that's because of gravity, right? You kind of put your hand down in a way, your elbow down, so that uh, your arm naturally falls to the side, and then you lift up the glass. But a robot, um, you know, that has no concept of, you know, things being natural. It's just a dumb robot. So you've got to specifically specify where every single joint is going to be, right? Every single angle. And some angles are better than others. And you've got to do things like avoid the ground here. You've got to avoid other obstacles. You've got to make sure the robot doesn't collide with itself, right? Self-collision is a big problem, right? So inverse kinematics, um, you cannot solve exactly. Um, and there are all these heuristics, all these different algorithms you have to use to find some approximate solution. And that, that is a whole deep field uh, within robotics. At the risk of belaboring the point, let me put it this way. The human body doesn't need to do super accurate self-collision computation. If I move my hand around, because I have the concept of pain, obviously, if I hit myself, I'm going to learn to stop doing that. There's feedback there. But a robot is just a dumb machine. So it's up to the programmer, the roboticist, to compute the motion in such a way that the robot doesn't hit itself. If I have one part of the robot here, and the end effector is here, it might seem trivial to just stop the robot right there. As long as I have the geometry correct, everything should be fine, right? But these robots have mass. Sometimes they have a lot of mass. And if I'm moving the robot really quickly, well, I've got momentum. So if I tell the robot to stop here, it's not going to stop immediately. It's going to carry some momentum, hit the other part of the robot, and then come back to the position that I specified. So because I didn't take into account dynamics, the robots hit itself, and I've just ruined a very expensive piece of equipment and maybe even endangered some people's lives. So here's another part of the textbook where they specifically get into inverse kinematics and some algorithms for solving it. And uh, again, this is just a, um, a 2D planar manipulator. And you can see that there are different um, ways you can reach the end goal. So for example, B and C, there's more than one solution. The elbow is down here, and for C, the elbow is up here. And the orientation of the end effector is different, um, but for, for some problems, maybe you don't care about the orientation that much. You just want to get the end effector to be able to reach this uh, red goal here to pick it up. So you can have several different solutions, maybe infinitely many solutions. Um, and because of that, there's some ambiguity in the problem um, and there are ways to, to deal with that. Okay, let's look at some code. So specifically, I'm going to introduce this library called Bullet, which is a physics simulation engine. Um, used a lot in robotics, especially in research. Um, they can do uh, motion planning for manipulators like here, um, but also you know things like uh, robotic dogs and all that sort of stuff. So um, it's got pretty good documentation and there's a lot of cool stuff you can do in it. So let's look at this code here. And I made a specific uh, file here, which just uh, it's really, really short, but all I did was I imported PyBullet um, and then I'm going to open up a IPython terminal at the bottom here. And in between, all I do is uh, open up the GUI and uh, I set gravity to 000. zero, zero. The reason is um, I don't want uh, to deal with dynamics today. I just want to do with kinematics. So that means I just want to move uh, the different joints around, but I don't want to deal with the masses and the weights and the, all the forces and stuff. Um, so I set gravity to zero everywhere, and then I called uh, p dot set real time simulation to true. So what that means is um, the GUI will immediately reflect any changes that I do. And in the middle here, all I'm doing is loading a URDF file, which is a format. Uh, it's kind of like XML, where it loads uh, a robot model. So inside this URDF file, it tells you all the different links, all the joints. Uh, the limits for the joints, how far you can move the motor one way or the other, um, and some other uh, things for graphics. And basically, we're going to look at three different uh, robot models here. I'm going to start with the simplest one, which is the 2D planar manipulator. And inside the actual IPython terminal, we're going to actually use PyBullet. OK, so just Python demo and I'll include this script so you guys can take a look and what happens is it opens up this GUI over here um, and you can use your cursor uh, to move around so hold down the control key and click to rotate it like this and you can uh, scroll 
go zoom in like this. Um, the viewer is a little finicky, but um, it does the job. So you can see this 2D planar manipulator. Let me get at a different angle here. So basically, you have this base, right? And there's the first link, and there's the second link. So uh, notice that they're slightly offset in Z. But looking at the top, so real quick, this X uh, axis is the red line. Um, the Y axis is green, Z is blue. So you can verify with the right hand rule that this is a right handed coordinate system. And the, uh, these coordinates show the world coordinates. And basically each link has its own uh, reference frame coordinate system, right? And a lot of robotics is just moving from one reference frame to another. So uh, notice that I've got two motors here. One is here, uh, a revolute joint, right? And another one is right here. And the end effector is there. So I can rotate this blue part in a circle, and I can rotate the white part in a circle about the point there. So by the way, uh, if I go through all possible values of these two joints, um, of all the joints in a robot, this end effector will trace out some greedy, complicated shape, right? That shape is called the reachable workspace. And it's kind of obvious what that means, but it's all the places this end effector can go. So it's all the parts that you can touch with the end effector of the robot. Um, and there's another concept, uh, which is the uh, dexterous workspace, which is um, it's not enough just to reach it, but you also have to be able to orient the end effector um, in any possible orientation about the point, right? So for example, if there's one point like way out here, okay, maybe I should point it right there, um, the end effector might be able to just barely reach it, but you can't uh, have the end effector approach it from some arbitrary angle. All the points where you can both reach it, but also have some arbitrary angle of attack, that complex shape is called the dexterous workspace because you can, you know, dexterously manipulate the object at that point. So anyway, back over here in the IPython terminal, um, I just ran the script and then before exiting, I dropped into this terminal here. All right, I just uh, made some space here and I got p and I've this pi bullet. And I got np, which is numpy, and uh, if you look at my script. I load the URDF file and I create this variable called robot. And this is just an integer, just zero. But it's just, um, it's the index of the object in the environment. And uh, this becomes more clear when you use PyBullet because I have to pass this index into uh, almost all the functions I'm going to use. So, uh, for example, I can do get num joins and I pass the index of this robot. And it tells me I have three joints. So what this means is, um, well, I got the base, I got this one in the middle, and the end effector itself is also a, a joint. Um, but we're just going to look at the, the first two. So uh, I can get the info for a particular joint. So let me just call robot and get the zeroth joint. So that's the base. And you can look at the PyBullet quick start documentation to see what all these uh, return values mean. But just real quick. Some things are obvious here, like the, the name of the joint, joint one, name of the link, right? Um, and then here, this is the lower limit of the joint angle. This is the upper limit. And these are in radians. Everything's in radians here. So this just means, you know, I can go from minus pi to positive pi. Um, so I can move in a complete circle. And if I look at the other index, so this is the, the guy in the middle here, right? Um, Joint 2, link 2, also the lower limit is minus pi, the upper limit is positive pi. So now I can actually move some of these joints. So for that, I want to do this function called reset joint state. All right, I pass robot, pass the index I want to move, so I'll just move joint 1. And let me just move it through uh, pi over 4, All right, so 45 degrees. And you can see over here in the viewer that it has um, moved by 45 degrees, right? So um, I can also do the same thing to the other 
index, the other joint. So here, let me let me uh, move by 90 degrees, and there you go, right? So that's uh, you know basically forward kinematics, right? I'm explicitly specifying the joint, um, and I'm seeing where the end effector is going to go. Um, and let me let me stand this point for a while. So I'm going to move this guy back to zero. Um, and let me straighten out the other link as well. And let me move the whole thing. I'm going to move the base uh, by 45 degrees. Okay. So notice that uh, so this whole thing is 45 degrees rotated, right? And I started out here. So the, the end effector was, if I look, look at the uh, x axis, it was 2 and then 0 for the other coordinates. But now I've moved to this 45 degree angle. So I can expect the end effector uh, to be, uh, you know, square root of 2, square root of 2 over here. Right. So uh, I can actually get that from pi bullet. So I'm going to use this nifty function get. Uh, link state. All right, so I can pass the robot index, and I can pass um, the first joint index. And if I call it, I get all the stuff. Um, the parts that I care about are the last two, so I'm just gonna get those out. And if you look at this, what I have is the translation as the first uh, vector here. And then I have this vector of four elements. And this is the orientation, the rotation. Okay. So you might be wondering, okay, why why um why four? Why not three for three dimensions, right? Um so this is something called a quaternion. And I'm not gonna go into the whole theory behind quaternions, but they are amazing and they show up everywhere in robotics and graphics, and you should definitely learn about them. So they are basically a generalization of complex numbers. So they were discovered by Hamilton, not the politician or the play, but the Irish mathematician. Uh, he discovered a lot of great things in math and physics, and uh, one of his legacies was the quaternion. So complex numbers are a generalization of real numbers, right? But quaternions are a further generalization of complex numbers, and they have some really interesting properties. Long story short, uh, we could use just three angles to represent rotation, right? Like in aerospace engineering, sometimes they use roll, pitch, yaw. But, you know, that's the minimal set that you need to represent rotation. But sometimes it can be unwieldy to use mathematically. And then on the other extreme, you have rotation matrices, right? You've got three uh, degrees of freedom, but you've, you have uh, nine elements in your matrix. So you've got a lot of, lot of uh, redundant uh, elements. But, you know, the rotation matrix itself has its own uh, benefits and disadvantages, but the quaternion, it's not the minimal set because you have four, but uh, there's a specific constraint it has to satisfy. So basically it's got to have a norm of one, and that constraint gets rid of the extra degree of freedom. So you got four numbers minus one degree of freedom, so you have three degrees of freedom. Um, and there's some really uh, useful properties of quaternions that make it uh, a pleasure to, to work with. But to make things a little bit uh, more intuitive, we can use a built-in function from PyBullet to convert a quaternion to a matrix. So, okay, so let me call this function again, but create some easy to understand variables here. Position and orientation, right? So the position, got my orientation. Okay, so PyBullet uh, provides this Handy function for converting quaternions into matrices. So I just pass an orientation here, and I'm going to get um, a nine vector. But I can reshape this with numpy into uh, a three by three matrix. Okay. So you see what's going on there. Um, this is a ro rotation matrix, right? And if you remember, this top element here is cosine theta, where theta is the rotation we went through. So uh, I know already that this is going to be pi over 4 because that's, you know, I made that happen. But I could do 
uh, Arcos, right, of this value here. And I get pi over 4. You can see that these are the same here. So we talked about homogeneous matrices earlier. And I can make a homogeneous matrix by combining the rotation matrix and the translation to one 4x4 four four matrix. So uh, let me create a matrix here. I'll call it transform. And um, I'm going to start out with the identity matrix. I could start out with, you know, matrix of all zeros, but um, I want to keep this one at the bottom here. So I just did the identity for convenience. And then um, I'm going to take the top left three by three sub matrix. I'm going to pass in that guy up there. Let me call it something. Rotation matrix. Okay, so transform. Uh, three by three rotation matrix, right? So I got that there, and now uh, I've got zero translation. But let me fix that by doing this, and now I've got everything in one nice four by four matrix, right? So this 4x4 four four matrix tells me um, where this, this link in the middle here is relative to the base. Right? And I can do the same thing for the end effector. Um, and basically by chaining these matrices together, by multiplying one after the other, I can uh, get from the base uh, all the way to the end effector. Let me do this. Uh, I will reset the joint state. Um, for the first link, and I'm going to, let me see, rotate it by another 45, right? So let's think about what's happening here. So I got the y-axis here, right? And this link, the second link, is lined up with the positive y-axis, right? Uh, the x-axis, positive x-axis of this link is lined up with the positive y-axis of the world, right? So that means... If I'm if I'm living in this coordinate system right here, then the y-axis of this guy is going to be this way, which uh, you can see is actually the negative x-axis of the uh, world coordinate system, right? So the homogeneous matrix will tell me all of that in the matrix itself, all right? And and everything I did just now, um, I've already created a function in uh, the script, so it's already loaded. So uh, for convenience, I can just call get transform. I pass in the robot. I pass in the link index. So I just put one in here again. And remember that this one means that I'm talking about uh, the coordinate system whose origin is at this first link there. Okay, So I call that, and it computes exactly what I uh, had before. But notice that the rotation is different, right? I, I uh, added another 45 degrees to make this 90 degrees relative to the x-axis. So if I look at these columns here, I see something really interesting. So normally, if you have the identity matrix, you have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So the z-axis did not change, right? I still have 0, 0, 1, right? Z-axis of this guy lines up with the z-axis of the world. But the x and y axes are different. So just like I said before, the x-axis of our new um, coordinate frame that's the uh, first column here. This is 0, 1, 0, which is the positive y-axis of the world, right? That's exactly what you see here, positive y-axis. This is positive x-axis in the local reference frame. Here, in the second column, I've got minus 1, 0, 0. That's negative x. So the y of this local coordinate system is the negative x of the world system. And that tells you the whole story about how this reference frame is situated relative to the world. This homogeneous matrix is a very compact and efficient way to represent positions and orientations. OK, finally, to connect everything back to the previous lecture, let's look at this rotation matrix again. Let me just say that this is a valid orthogonal matrix. So if I take the transpose and numpy can just do dot t, right? So I can do the transpose times 
uh, the matrix itself. And I'm going to get the identity matrix. Let me uh, round this so it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. Right? It's just the good old identity matrix. And no matter how I rotate uh, these links, if I get the rotation matrix of any of these links, I'm still going to end up with a valid uh, orthogonal matrix. And also, uh, another property of orthogonal matrices is that the inverse is equal to the transpose. So if I do numpy linalg inv rope mat, I get this guy. And if I subtract the transpose, they should be uh, equal. I should get all zeros. So again, let me round. And I'll get uh, all zeros everywhere, just as we expect. Okay, so now let's look at some other robots. I'm going to modify my demo script to load. Uh, instead of a very simple planar robot, we're going to look at a real industrial robot. So this comes from a company called Uh So it's a German company, and they make all these uh, interesting looking robots. Uh, some of them are really like curvy, which is their signature. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a serious industrial robot, and um, they've got a, a model here included in the bullet SDK. So let's run the demo again. I'm gonna get up my uh, GUI. Let me scroll in a bit, and you can see this kind of weird looking robot. Um, so this is a rigid body. Each link is a rigid body, even though it looks kind of weird like this. Um, and they're kind of hidden, but you have motors inside of all these guys. And the base is here, uh, set at the origin of the world, and it's fixed there. And at the end here is the end effector. So uh, let's kind of go through what we did again. We can do get num joints uh, of our robots. We've got seven joints now, including the base. So uh, how about this? Let's reset the joint state. Uh, robot 1 and how about 90 degrees this time? Okay, so that makes sense, right? Um, so this kind of obvious point, but if I rotate the motor at the very bottom here, um, it's going to rotate everything above it, right? And I can do that for any index. So let me change uh, 4 here. Let me pick a more dramatic one, maybe two. Uh, how about a different angle? And how about index three? Okay. So I got this, right? And uh, you can do the same exercise where you kind of go through and you, you get the transform of, you know, whatever index you want here. So let's say, I don't know, the, the last one. Um, it's kind of hard to see because I didn't round, but uh, I have a valid uh, rotation matrix. I'll prove it right now uh, by doing the whole uh, inverse, sorry, inverse or or uh, transpose trick again, right? Let me round. Still a valid rotation matrix. So you might see these minus signs because of floating point, point error, but you know, same thing. Uh, and then I can get the translation. So I'm getting the last column here. So let's look at this and then look at the GUI and see if this is roughly correct. So the X is minus 0.7, so. And this is telling me, telling me the uh, the position of this end effector here. So, sure, minus 0.7, that's uh, reasonable. It's not quite over here. It's kind of there, right? And y is positive a little bit, so I see 0.23. That makes sense. And finally, for the z, it's kind of hard to tell because I don't have you know uh, tick marks here. But it's 0.5. Sure, seems reasonable. So. Uh, we can successfully get the uh, rotation and translation of this guy. Okay, so now instead of the code, let me 
play around with this GUI. So I can actually click on the robot, and as long as I have real-time simulation set to true, set to one, then I can drag this around and the robot will try to follow me. And basically what's happening under the hood is that PyBullet has its own inverse kinematics solver, and it will try to move all the joints such that it'll get as close as possible to my cursor. Right. Um, and it's going to actually take into account the dynamics, uh, so the mass and everything of this robot. But the thing is, this robot is fixed to this point right here. So the robot's basically, uh, because of you know Newton's third law, action-reaction, uh, be able to more or less follow me. So to actually get into how that inverse kinematic solver works, um, you've got to do some reading beyond just linear algebra. But let me show you another cool thing, which is uh, if I leave the demo, uh, I'm going to finally go to our last robot. So this is a humanoid robot, also provided by the bullet uh, GitHub repo. So I just call demo again, and now I got this fairly complex humanoid robot, this little toy, right? And I can move around, and if you call get num joints, get num joints, um, I get a whole bunch of joints, all right? And I can move these around if I want to, um, but let me just drag it. So uh, there's no gravity. I said gravity to zero. But there's also no fixed point. So unlike the Kuga robot where the base is fixed, you know, the robot can exert uh, forces relative to that fixed point to counteract uh, the forces of my cursor. But this guy, there's no fixed point, so it's like it's floating in space. But if I uh, start rotating it, it's just going to go on like basically forever. And it's going to fly off if I give it some uh, push. So this is pretty weird. So I can do some really useless things like spin this guy around like super, super fast. Um, and then I can even uh, kind of fly him off somewhere. So where do you go? There he is. There he is, going off into the stratosphere. So last thing I want to talk about here are some other libraries. So, uh, you know, we talked about Bullet, but, uh, you know, it's great for research, um, but there are some other libraries too, like OpenRave, which is uh, not as good documentation, and it's sometimes difficult to build, but uh, this is used in production, and it's uh, typically more efficient. And uh, you can go through some examples here. And it's a really great library I used for years. It's a bit of a learning curve, but there are you know real automated factories and real warehouses that are using this uh, software every day. Another one is called Moveit, which is also used in production by uh, several companies. If you're interested, this is definitely worth learning. It also integrates with this thing called the Gazebo, which is another uh, framework. So you can see a simulated warehouse here, and they've got a Kuga robot here. And also they got the humanoid robot from before over here. So this community is like really connected. So they're all uh, they all interface with each other. So like uh, Ross, the robot op operating system, also integrates uh, pretty much all of these. So you can go ahead and go down the rabbit hole in terms of robotics libraries. Finally, I just wanted to look at a cool picture of a robot, which is the Canada Arm, and this was contributed by Canada to the International Space Station, and it's a giant manipulator attached to the ISS, and uh, it's used to do things like repair parts of the ISS, um, and in general, it's just it's just really cool. So uh, there are a lot of papers describing the inverse kinematics of the Canadarm, and in particular, there is this PhD thesis from this person, uh, Vincent Dubanchet. Sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name, but this is a really great thesis, and there are all sorts of awesome explanations of spacecraft, robots, and the linear algebra involved and lots of algorithms and physics. So uh, really cool PhD thesis here. And uh, if you got time, I recommend you kind of browse through this. And as in most robotics papers, uh, this thesis makes heavy use of homogeneous matrices. So specifically, um, there's this great figure about the Canada arm. And you can see that the 2D planar two joint robotic arm that we looked at before the principles from that apply to this manipulator as well. You just have a bunch of revolute joints here, just a bunch of motors, right? And then this RE at the end here, this is the reference frame of the end effector. 
And for each joint, you have an associated theta. This is the theta that you can control. And for a specified goal for the end effector, a specific translation and orientation, you can use inverse kinematics to find a solution for these theta values. Okay, so that wraps up this little section on robotics. And I hope I got you interested in robotics and given you a taste of some of the math involved. And PyBullet, uh, I recommend you play around with it. Uh, it's a really useful, powerful, and interesting library. And some of the other ones like OpenRave and MoveIt are also uh, definitely worth checking out. So next time, we will go back to theory and talk specifically about least squares. I know I've been hyping it up a lot, but it deserves the hype. It's a very simple but profoundly powerful algorithm. So we'll get into that next.